Theoretically, nothing's supposed to grow, but look, everything is green, everything is flourishing. So far, it's worked. So far. Just asking for a friend, how safe is this? <laughs> it's okay. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty safe. What are you growing here? I mean, what are all the plants that are growing here? It's easier to ask what we, we're not growing. What do you not grow here? Exactly. <laughs> If you don't know what's in the ground, you're, you're in a mm. sense acting blindly. We're sending sensors to Africa, to Asia, to places that, that you will never imagine. Basically, we're teaching the world how to feed itself. What you have here is, is examples of cancer cells that are being killed by, by natural plant substances. Yes, exactly. The desert has a lot to offer. The Zionist dream still exists and lives in our hearts. We all remember the story of the 12 spies. When Moses sent them in the land, we all know the beautiful picture of those two spies carrying the grapevine. But when the people of Israel came back from the diaspora after the second exile, when God is bringing them back in the beginning of the 19th century, the biggest problem was how would they provide for themselves? There was a need, there was a necessity. And this necessity brought Israel in the field of agriculture to levels which none of our neighbors got to. Israel is leading in the agriculture worldwide. Agriculture turned into a science here in the land of Israel, and it turned into a science because of necessity. I believe that God, the same God that brought us into the land, gave us a supernatural wisdom in the field of agriculture. Let us see what God did in this field in the land of Israel. It was real people with real ambition who transformed this land from the desert into an agricultural dreamland, like the one we're standing in right now. And when you think about the miracle of the transformation, the depth of that transformation, you realize what a unique characteristic those people truly had. We're looking at a flourishing, green, amazing desert, which it's kind of an oxymoron. Instead of struggling, you're sitting in a place that is a mass exporter of goods to the entire world. It's layer on layer on layer on layer of innovation, research, discovery, necessity, pushing into just really creative ideas. Out of every challenge grows an opportunity here in the desert. So you're walking through the desert, and you keep looking at all these plants, and you're saying to yourself, there must be something more. I've met two kinds of Israelis. The ones that a challenge for them is a, is a closed door and that's it. And the kind of Israelis that said that the closed door is only an excuse to get into this room through the window. I took a journey deep into southern Israel, to the Arava. The Arava is a long desert valley along the border with Jordan that stretches from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Elat and it's incredibly hot and dry here. Surprisingly, it's also a mainstay of Israel's agriculture industry. What a place, Nadav. No place like home. Look at this beautiful view. This is what we see every morning from our window. And it's very much not what you would expect from uh, the middle of the desert, quote unquote. More agriculture than many areas of the country have. Are probably greener than most of a lot of the places you've been at. And uh, this is, you know, the land of the endless summer. Right now we're in Chatziva, a cooperative agricultural village in southern Israel, or a moshav, as it's known in Hebrew. It was founded in 1965 as part of Israel's desert agriculture revolution. With 150 independent farms operating today, Chatziva remains a key player in making sure desert farming continues to thrive. Nadav, who oversees the entire moshav, gave me the grand tour. So let, let's go back to your origin story. You're not of this place. I'm not originally of this place. Originally of this place. How did you end up in the middle of the desert? The Zionist dream still, you know, exists and lives in our hearts. What is that in your mind? So look, we <clears throat> are about, we're half a mile from the Jordanian border and to the west also nothing there. We've decided we want to grow our kids here and basically make the desert bloom, bring a different kind of Israel here on a human level. And right now I'm the CEO of the Moshav. So I wasn't even born here, not raised here, but now I, you know, as they say, I run this joint. 
when you get into your car and you drive south of Beersheba into the desert, you see a lot of yellow, you know, this is desert, why would I want to live here? And then you take a left turn into the Moshav and you see a lot of green. And every time we have people that haven't spent much time here, they say, it's amazing. I didn't realize it's so much green here. The Israeli market is very small. How many people in Israel eat? What, 8 million people? It's nothing. We grow for about 80 million people because people are, you know, persistent, they're trying, and it's working. The topsoil here is something that almost nothing grows on. And we can see date farms and grapefruits, peppers and tomatoes and all kind of, a, you know, it's the good stuff. a ton of stuff. things that don't belong in this place, basically. It's a ton of things that don't belong in this place. Okay. And, and also the knowledge that people mm -hmm. have gained through the years, we don't keep it to ourselves. Basically, we're teaching the world how to feed itself. Now you've entered Moshav Chatzeva. See the, the day trees mm -hmm. and the little uh, turnabout that says, in the Negev, the people of Israel will be tested by David Ben-Gurion. This is how we live our so, life. So far, it seems like you've done well with this test. So, so far, so, so far. good. So far, so good. These are called net houses. They're not green houses. This is a greenhouse. You would grow tomatoes in it, cucumbers. And to our left, it's tunnels, it's eggplants, watermelons. You can see we also grow corn here. Israeli agriculture is very high-tech. We moved from throwing some water on the ground and see whatever grows to drip irrigation, hanging the plants, making more out of the three major things that you need for growing something. You need soil, you need water, and you need sun. So sunlights we have year-round. Water, we don't have good quality water here, but we drill for about a mile deep and we take very salty water, mm -hmm. but we learn how to use them in the fields. Even the soil that we step on, most of the crops are not grown on this soil. So we bring soil from other parts of Israel we we'll put it on the topsoil that already exists and then we grow on it. About a hundred years ago, when Jews from mostly European countries, cold countries, when they moved to Israel, they wanted to tear off this image of the Jew that was always looked down and always were looked down at. And overnight, they, they shed the, the shell of uh, the diaspora of like, of 2,000 years of being detached from the land and the country. You saw a new Jewish face. You saw the strong farmer. You don't see the black clothes. You don't see the long beard. You see the strong Jew that is moving to Israel and making the desert bloom. It's sort of like the ultimate test of character. You can't be soft and make it in the desert. Even if you look into the biblical narrative, you can't ever achieve something of virtue or quality without going through a desert phase, without the hardship and the struggle. Let's show you some of our greenhouses. We talk so much. Here you go. Welcome. We have the cherry tomatoes, which are very famous for Israel. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way that we grow them, this is a stem, right? This is a tomato stem. Mm -hmm. So it should just grow from the ground straight up, right? But what we do here, we take it around, back and forth, back and forth. Why? When you have a single stem that goes up, you can have 20 tomatoes, mm -hmm. 40 tomatoes. Here you can take out of one stem, one plant, about 400 tomatoes. Why do we even need to grow things on the ground? We have strawberries. There's a little bit of dirt in it, and they use whatever water they need. And because they're in an angle, whatever leftover water flows like down to a water tank, and you reuse the water. Here you have mint. Now, why grow mint on the ground? Why not grow it on a post? Let it go up. Easier to pick, less insects, less bugs. If I have a greenhouse, okay, so I'll probably plant several plants and let it grow. No, there's a better way to do it. Try to hang it, try to push it, try to pull it. We're standing in this place that's a hub of thinking creatively about how to maximize everything. Exactly. So tell me know. how it is. Just dig into it. Oh, this is juicy. Great, huh? Mm. Very sweet. I can live off of that. Mm. So right now, we're going to a date farm that a friend of mine is working on. It's right over there. So now we're going to meet Tomer. Hey, Tomer. Hi, nice to How's meet you. How's it going? <laughs> okay. Coming let's... up? Yeah, yeah, we're coming up. So Tomer, yeah. you're the real deal. When we think about the people out in the desert making agriculture happen, you're the face of that. I appreciate it. I want to teach my kids also to know what is hard work and why we're here in Israel. I need to do it myself before I teach other people to do it. So I take the challenge on myself right now. So I imagine, Toma, most of the work happens at height, and we're here mainly because we want to go up. So let's go up. Let's go up. Let's go up. So here you can actually see the view. On this side is the Moshav itself, mm -hmm. Hatseva, more Day plantation, greenhouses. When you get up at height, it's even more shocking how much there's a contrast. You're in the middle of the most deserty desert you could imagine. 
This is exactly the future of agriculture in Israel. If Tomer and her likes will choose to come here to learn about it, to work in this environment for a year or two, I can see a bright future because this is going to be a very high-tech field of expertise. We think here in the Arava, this is the, the next field where Israel is going to lead the world, and Tomer is a perfect example for it. The early pioneers who came back to the land in the late 19th century endured incredible hardship trying to cultivate the land again. And over time, with the development of technology, things got easier. Today, things are much different. Israel became an exporter of technology and knowledge to the farthest corners of the earth. In fact, in deserts around the world today, plants and fields are growing with technology coming out of the land of Zion. So we've seen how Israeli innovation has helped with the desert problem. But now we're going to meet something slightly different. We're on our way up to Netanyahu, which is in the northern coastal area of Israel, to meet with Cropex, which is this new startup company who've developed a new sensor package, which is supposed to help farmers around the world have a deeper understanding of exactly what's happening in their field in real time. Tomeu, we're about to see a demonstration of the system do you want to introduce your all-star team before we uh, get started? Yeah, sure thing. Avi recently did Aliyah from New Jersey. Uh, he's an agronomist and data scientist on the agronomy team. And Guy is the VP of agronomy. He knows everything there is to know. So he's got the, the guy with the plan, huh? Exactly, the brain. Mai uh, grew up in Los Angeles. She's uh, part of the customer service team. So, so this is it. I mean, I was expecting, you know, some heavy machinery. It looks like you guys brought the same equipment I have at home. It's just uh, one power tool and that's all you need. All I do is I find where I want to put it in the field, and then I dig a hole. Just make sure. And then we just screw it into the ground as such. And it's that simple. I can now see the data from the soil. I can see that it was recently fertilized. I can see the moisture content of the soil, and I can see soil temperature. So with this data that I get immediately, the farmer can make much better decisions. CropEx represents Israeli agritech at its finest. It's a smart farming device that gives farmers real-time insights into the conditions of their soil, and it's being used around the world. CropEx is part of the agtech revolution. So we have sensors in this device that measure the moisture of the soil, electroconductivity, which is salinity, the mm -hmm. saltiness of the soil. Uh, we connect that to nitrogen and fertility, and temperature. Uh, the part that you see out of the ground transmits to the cloud. What have farmers been doing so far? In many places, yeah, they do this. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Still today in the first world. Yeah. We create much more value between 10 and 20% yield increasement, which is, which is huge, huge. Huge. With every sensor that is installed across the globe, our system continues to learn and to get smarter. And the power of the system grows because the system Because has, well, the system is getting more the clever. System, yeah, exactly. When I was done with my previous startup, I really looked for something different that kind of had a do-good part to it. Uh, you know, since then, I haven't looked back. Yet again, the challenges Israelis are facing have led to solutions that impact people everywhere in the world. This is what happens when God blesses a nation, promises to prosper them, and then empowers them to carry out his promises. If you can make it in the Arava, you can probably make it anywhere in Israel. If you want to be a pioneer in any field of expertise, this is the place to be. It's a huge honor being able to expose Israel to the world through a positive technology, you know, that, that really helps save the globe. From the Arava, where people are putting in the hours and developing methods to make the desert bloom, to innovative Israeli tech that is creating a global smart farming network. The future looks bright, and the sky's the limit. We use technology and innovation to grow crops in the desert despite the harsh conditions. But when you take those conditions and combine them with agricultural know-how and medical science, miracles can take place. Hello, Rivki. Shalom. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Is this your famous lab? Yes, please enter. Thank you. <laughs> At a young age, Dr. Rivki Ophir packed her bags and headed to Israel's Arava Desert, where she got her PhD in plant biology. For decades, she has been studying the healing properties of plants native to the Arava. And what she's discovered is that their ability to heal is directly related 
to the desert environment in which they grow. So we're here because you present a fascinating story. So maybe we can start sort of with the background story of how you got to here today. Love brought me here. This was in 1973. I joined my husband, Moshele. He was the founder of the Moshev Chatseva. From 1973 to 1982, we worked on the fields and raised three kids. And I always dream about going back to science. Lucky me, on 1982, I went to do my PhD in Ben Gurion University. I asked the question, why the immune system failed to eradicate cancer diseases? It's quite relevant still. It's quite, quite relevant still. Being a mother, travel a lot in the desert. Around me, I saw the desert plants, and I already had the idea that there is some secret in this plant, and maybe I will be able to harness them to my research. In one of the plants, which is called Achillea fragmentosa, I found something very interesting, not just against cancer, but against uh, brain diseases. Mm -hmm. There was one compound that I really liked, so the chemists say, bring me a lot of this material and I will uh, separate this compound and give you a tube with this compound. So I went to the desert, to the same place where I collect this plant, took the seeds, went to the farm, irrigate, fertilize, etc. And I have a huge amount of bags with the plant. And I went to this chemist in Tel Aviv. And he said, I need to disappoint you. I can find this compound only in the desert plant. I don't find it where you irrigate. While trying to extract this miracle compound, Dr. Rivki stumbled across the true secret of the desert. Now, many people, when they imagine a plant, we want to give it the best conditions. But in reality, especially in the desert, they need some kind of stress. The plants that grow in the desert, going through many, many harsh conditions, like irradiation, salt, sun, no rain. The quality only comes out when it's hard. Yes. So this is the famous lab? Yes, and in the lab we have cells. Uh-huh. Cancer cells which grow here in the incubator. Can I take a look? You can look on them. In order to be expert, you need to look in the microscope. So I'm not an expert. Are, yes. So the yellow ones in your sample are the cancer cells that died it, from desert plant extracts. Exactly. Yes. That's and, a, and quite a good sample there. Yes, we have many samples like this. You say this in passing as if it's like an obvious thing, but what you have here is, is examples of cancer cells that are being killed by, by yes. natural plant substances. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's yes. quite a statement. Exactly. For you, it's like, yes, another day in the office, but for most people, that's, that's news. Exactly. It's not chemo, it's not radiation. Yes. That is killing cancerous cells. So many years, I tell the people that there is something unique in the desert, and suddenly I was able to prove it. It's just a beautiful process. Say, so like, look, there must be something about these plants. There's something about the hardship, and then you, you proved it. It's almost impossible to miss the analogies between the personal journey and the story of reclaiming the desert. You sort of did that same process on the cellular level. I agree with you, I really agree. Thank you for making all these conclusions. It's your story. <laughs> <laughs> With us today is Professor Chaim Rabinovich. The Bible tells us that the land of Israel is the land of milk and honey. And with him, we're going to discuss the whole issue of agriculture. Professor Rabinovich, welcome. Welcome to our show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. In Israel, you're known to be the father of the sherry tomatoes. Uh, I'm not the father. I'm a member of a team, maybe head of the team and so on and so forth, but it all started with our previous work on extending the shelf life of the tomato. Indeed, the shelf life of the tomato was extended, but B, uh, the tomato could stay on the bush for a longer period of time, thus accumulate more sugars, more acids, more volatiles, 
So the, all the goodies, instead of being compacted into, let's say, 50 tons, is being compacted into 25, so it's even more tasty. Uh, picking cherry tomatoes is, is laborious. Uh, a trained worker uh, with salad tomato, who does like that, yeah. picks about 800 kilograms per day. A cherry tomato is 60 kilograms per mm. day, so it's much more expensive. And we asked ourselves, when you buy grapes, do you ever dream of buying grapes individually? <laughs> Never. Never. <laughs> you th think about a bunch of grapes, right? So why can't we do the same thing with cherry tomatoes? Oh, beautiful. So, oh, when a fruit develops seeds, actually a lot of energy, which means lots of sugars, lots of uh, fatty acids, proteins, and so on and so forth, go into the seed, which is the embryo of the next generation. Now, Israel was the first one to develop what we call parthenocarpic cucumbers once they develop without seeds. That means, A, you don't need fertilizers, so you save a lot of the space. Mm -hmm. All the plants are female for this respect. B, cucumbers are much more tasty. And this was spread all over the world. In every, every field of agriculture that you, you throw a stone, you find a touch of Israeli innovative mm. approach. When we talk about Israel, Israel is known that is leading in agriculture. It's probably because of necessity, but in which... Mainly because mainly, of necessity. Yeah, necessity. <laughs> it's a combination of very high-skilled farmers, uh, very good supporting system of experts, uh, very good contacts. Most of Israeli agriculture uh, farmers our university graduates, hmm, and they keep, they keep, well, there are very few of them today, there are about 12,000 growers in Israel. And it's not surprising to get a telephone call from a farmer, look, I was a student like 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I have a problem, can you help me in answering the problem and so on and so forth. Very high sophisticated seed industry of fruit and vegetables that were developed in Israel and are being sold now all over the world, rather than importing uh, things that were developed, let's say in Denmark, and I have nothing against Denmark, but it is suitable to a different climate, different soil, different, different, soil, different everything. So by adding this together with good farming, you can get a good, good, good produce. Professor Chaim Rabinovich, what a great insight on agriculture. Thank you very much. And for you, our friend, stay with us for another insight on Israel. Thank you for joining us as we provide a spiritual insight of what God is doing in Israel and in the Middle East. If you want to learn more about what God is doing in Israel, make sure to visit us on our webpage and follow us on social media. Shalom and God bless you for Jerusalem.